We are Dr. Stan here at the Genesis Communication Network, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and, and picturesque Monterey Bay, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king, but in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality, not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views. And well, for the next hour, they're going to be the views of Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who certainly is taught at the university level, who's been an advisor to end industry, who was in the Reagan, the uh, Sydney uh, Administration, Department of Education. He's a prolific writer, and we carry a number of his books, all of the books that are in print you can get from Radio Liberty, by calling 1-800-544-8927. But he's written a new series called uh, The Power Elite, the first volume, is The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. And the second is the power elite, their history and their future. And so I'm going to let certainly Dr. Cuddy pick up this story because, of course, there are secret societies out there. They're working behind the scenes, and you're certainly not going to ever hear this seriously discussed by the controlled media, a media that is firmly in the hands of these secret and covert and truly occult organizations. Dr. Cuddy, you pick up the story. <clears throat> Okay, uh, well, let me, uh, before I launch into that, uh, just pick up on what you just said about the, the control media. Um, what, ha- what happens is the, the paralete, as I call them, uh, they're not just liberals, you know, and so therefore if you're a conservative, you're against the liberals and you're against the paralete. Well, what they use is a dialectical process, and uh, one of the... Uh, major members of Skull and Bones in the late 1800s was William Whitney, and he developed a strategy. And they they network with other people like the Rhodes Scholars and Cecil Rhodes' Secret Society and the Fabian Socialist and and so on. Uh, but uh, they, what he said is, we'll uh, contribute heavily to both major political parties, and they'll alternate power. Uh, and so the uh, stupid public thinks it has a choice. Uh, and now, what you what you have to remember is they've dumbed the American public down. And you say, well, yes, I understand they've dumbed them down and, and so forth. But you, but you have to appreciate the, the implications of that, the consequences of that. So, for example, if you're a listener and you're saying, oh, yeah, I know they've, you know, education's not what it was. The liberals are in control and they've, uh, they've dumbed our education down. I, I got it. Well, you, you have it, but you only have part of it uh, because... Uh, in the in the dumbing down process, uh, what they try to do is is create a situation where you're historically uh, lacking in what they've done before in their machinations that uh, that they go through. Uh, so uh, if you look uh, historically at certain things, uh, you'll you know about you know the founding of the country and the Declaration of Independence. And, and so forth and so on. Uh, but what you need to remember is uh, there's more to it than that. So for, for example, let me give you an example of today. All right, today a lot of people are dissatisfied with the Republicans, how they didn't vigorously in the Senate, and some even in the House. Boehner uh, object to Obamacare vigorously enough. We need to cut spending and so forth and so on. That's, that's the general perception of a lot of conservatives today. And so what's the answer? Well, a lot of people say, well, let's, let's, you know, let's go with the Tea Party. The Tea Party, that's, that's the answer. Well, uh, I'm not going to say anything against the the Tea Party movement, but you have to understand. See, this is where history becomes very, very important. You have to understand that historically, whenever there has been a third party, a third party, uh, what happens is if that party gains any traction, if it gains any momentum, if it gains any strength, one of the two major parties will start 
picking off issues, you know, adopting certain of those issues, not the whole plank of the, the, the party, but certain of, the, of issues, just enough to uh, drag that party back into oblivion. Uh, for example, we used to have parties that were called the Populist Party, oh, about a hundred and so years ago, and then used to have something called the Progressive Party, about a hundred years or so ago, roughly, you know, back to back, sort of. And you say, well, you know, what happened to those parties? Well, why did they come about? Well, they came about just like the Tea Party's coming about, because the two major parties were not meeting the needs of a large segment of the public. And then, you know, the, the, they sort of got their act together a little bit, the major parties, and then they did their usual uh, abandoning of the American public, like they always do. And so up uh, pops the other party. But once again, the, one of the two major political parties of that day sort of uh, started to adopt certain of the progressive or the populist notions, right? So that uh, the populist party or the progressive party, which had started, you know, 10 percent, they got 15 percent, 20 percent, then it starts falling off. You know, it goes back to 15 percent, down to 10 percent. Why? Well, because one of the two major political parties started adopting certain aspects of it. And so you, you have to be cognizant of these things because that's probably what would happen to the, the Tea Party. Uh, what would happen to the Tea Party is... If the Tea Party gains a lot of strength, you'll probably find the Republicans in this case, because there's more Tea Party members with the Republicans, seeming, seeming, at least temporarily, to say, yes, I guess those Tea Party people are right, and so we will adopt, you know, whatever it is, immigration restriction, you know, whatever it is. And they'll adopt just enough of it to put a little crimp in the Tea Party's numbers, and therefore, you know, they won't be successful, and after maybe a major campaign, you know, major effort in 2016 and 2020 and all, what will happen is they'll sort of, you know, wane, as it were. It's, it's, it's typical. This, this is what happens every time. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't vigorously pursue your philosophy, your position, and if you want to support it with somebody with a Tea Party, fine. I'm just saying you need to be historically aware of what the two major political parties do. This is what they do. It's an act. You know, it's an act. They don't mean it. They just, they just start adopting adopting it temporarily until they uh, quash any major movement to undermine their power. That's, that's what they do. Well, let me, just, uh, let me just point out for our listeners out there who would like to document what Dr. Oh, what Dr. Kelly is saying, this reference to Whitney and, uh, and the fact that we, uh, in the late 1800s, Whitney talked about how we had financed both political parties and well, first one would win and the other. You'll find the reference to that in Professor Quigley's uh, classic book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. Just index read it for Whitney and you'll find that the reference is there. And basically, of course, this is exactly what happens. You need to understand that our perceptions are created for us, our minds are molded, our concepts created largely by men we have never heard of. Those were the words in essence are almost of Edward Bernays, Sidney, uh, uh, the, uh, the basic, I think it was Sigmund Freud's nephew, but that is it. He wrote a book, Sidney, yep. going to the background of, of how our minds are controlled, and they do it, they do it so effectively, and the average individual doesn't even realize he's constantly being manipulated by the media that's controlled by the very people he opposes. Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and and uh, picking up on that, uh, especially in the media, what a lot of people think if they're, let's say, conservative types, is well, it's, it's those uh, evil liberals, and therefore we have the the wonderful conservative uh, types, uh, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity, and so forth and so on, and it's us against them. Say it's us against them. Well, uh, not 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 quite <laughs> as simple as that. Now, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and the rest of them, they say some, some very, you know, good things. They, they do. But what you have to, you have to step back and sort of ask yourself some fundamental questions. Like, how did Rush Limbaugh get where he is? I mean, why, why did he get there? And I'm not going to go so much into the background, but a, a person at ABC was not ready for retirement, but he was urged to retire early so that they could pick this fellow, Rush Limbaugh, 25 or so years ago from Sacramento, and put him in that spot, right? 
Now, why would they do that? I mean, why would they do that? Well, you got to think about it. His mentor was William F. Buckley. And we've been in through what William F. Buckley's background is. And he started saying, there's no conspiracy theories. Rush Limbaugh did. There's no such thing as conspiracies. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a conspiracy. And Rush Limbaugh knows it. But he was never going to tell you. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Dennis Cuddy here at Genesis. Well, Dr. Stan, back here at the Genesis Communication Network, our guest, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, is talking about the fraudulent nature of the two-party system, and basically, of course, how they control both political parties, but they give you the idea that it's going to make a lot of difference, and yet both political parties are dedicated to this idea of ever bigger government. The Republicans just want a little smaller big government than the uh, certainly than the Democrats do, but they're both certainly go right along along with the wars. In fact, the Republicans are much more militaristic and all these senseless wars than the Democrats. At least the Democrats say they're wrong usually, whereas the Republicans sort of sell the idea that we're, we're fighting for our freedom. Certainly we're fighting to preserve America. Uh, we're not fighting to preserve America. We're fighting to bring about a world government and to destroy uh, certainly uh, anybody who opposes that movement to for world government, and of course the Vietnam War was simply a distraction uh, for a 10-year war that we fought. We could have won it any time in, in six weeks. I was told that personally by both uh, certainly four-star Marine General Lou Walt and by uh, Ambassador William H. Sullivan. Both of them said we could have won the war in six weeks. All you had to do was invade North Vietnam, but they wouldn't do that. They needed a diversion so we could bring in the Great Society and bring in the socialist programs, which today are bankrupting our nation, will ultimately lead to the loss of freedom as we know it. Dr. Dennis Ketty, pick up the story. Well, uh, once again, I'll I'll pick up what uh, you just said, because uh, this is another good example that you've given of how the power elite manipulates things. Um, uh, this is what one strategically placed person like Colonel Edward Mandel House, Woodrow Wilson's chief advisor, did. He did, he did exactly that about 100 years ago. Uh, at the end of the war, the First World War, toward the end of the First World War, you were starting to see the communist, uh, the Red uh, Revolution over in uh, Russia, Lenin and Trotsky and those people. And uh, Colonel House, uh, after the war, wrote uh, in his diary that uh, a number of people, leaders, Clemenceau uh, and Orlando, Clemenceau of France and Orlando of Italy, and uh, you know Woodrow Wilson were being con- coming concerned about these communists, and they were thinking, you know, maybe we ought to—I mean, maybe we ought to take a second look at these guys. They're they're a little violent here. They're going to spread all over the world. They're using this, you know, sort of the terrorist rhetoric of the day, uh, conquering the world, workers of the world unites, or a world revolution, international communism, they were talking about. And so they were thinking of uh, taking measures to actually militarily put them down. Uh, but uh, Colonel House said he basically, in his diary, uh, that Dr. Stan uh, got a hold of at a strategically important <laughs> time when they were uh, just uh, uh, letting it go you know, after, after the 75 years, but before publication, which of course they didn't do later. So he was there the exact the right time to, to get a hold of that thing. Uh, he basically said he lied. He said, I, he's writing his diary, he said, I basically lied. I lied to Wilson. I lied to Orlando. I lied to Clemenceau. I told him, no, you can't do anything about these guys, these communists. No, just, just forget it. And then he wrote right after that, he said, however, I, Colonel House, I knew that they small, you know, division or something, you know, uh, of tanks and so forth could have put them down. You know, no big deal. But I told him, no, you can't do this. Too big a job. Too big an effort. Forget it. So here we go. You know, the power lead has their particular agent at that time, Colonel House, manipulating events and information to the leaders of the world so as to create uh, what the power lead uh, wanted. And, you know, I'm not going to divert into why they wanted all that, but it's all part of this dialectical process of communism and Nazism and capitalism and so forth and so on. 
And so uh, what uh, what I was saying about uh, the media, which is what Dr. Stan had last said uh, before, at the last time uh, there was a break, uh, they, they use people like a Rush Limbaugh. They get them strategically uh, in position. And then, of course, uh, William F. Buckley was a member of the CFR, and so his hero, of course, he couldn't possibly uh, be involved with uh, any, any conspiracy. And so Rush uh, says, well, there just can't be any conspiracy. And he hasn't given it recently, I think, but he used to, about 15 years ago, give what he called the kook test. And one of the ten questions was, if you believe that David Rockefeller of the CFR is plotting to have a world government, then you're a kook. You know, you're a kook. You're a nut. You, you know, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Of course, he hasn't said that recently, especially over the last 11 years since David Rockefeller's book came out, <laughs> Memoirs, where, he, where Rockefeller basically admitted it. In fact, I sent a copy of that with some other stuff to Rush's brother uh, out there in Missouri to, to, give, to give to Rush. I don't know if he did or not, but I sent it to him. And pointing it out, and I put in my little red ink, I said, what does this do to Rush's kook test? I wrote, wrote on the thing to, to his brother. So anyway... Well, you know, Dennis, uh, many years ago in San Francisco, for about 25 years, there was a fellow named Jim Eason, and Jim was a, an honest-to-goodness good conservative. And uh, But he had on KGO, which was the largest uh, talk radio program in, in um, Northern California. And I was very often invited to come up to be a guest host, and I'll never forget the day that Jim Eason and I were sitting in the studio, it was during the break time, and having a cup of coffee together, and, and he looked over at me and he said, Stan, and he said, if I went on this radio and said what I really believed, they'd fire me tomorrow. Then, of course, uh, the, uh, we went back on the air. He got before the microphone. And he said, and if anybody had tried to tell me what to say on this radio program, I would quit tomorrow. <laughs> and then he looked over at me with a big grin and he winked. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the reality. Uh, Jim did a lot of good. And actually, uh, Russ is doing a lot of good, except the fact he's always playing down the conspiracy. He knows it a conspiracy. Jim Eason certainly let people talk about it. He never embraced the idea, although he knew in his heart of hearts it was there. Well, I can tell this now. Jim's long since left KGO, but he was a good patriot. He you know, certainly influenced a lot of people conservatively, and I hope that many of those people did learn already that there is a conspiracy. It controls both political parties, and it makes mockery of our electoral process, and it sends our boys to fight and no win wars all throughout the world to bring about a one world government, a one world financial system to destroy Christianity and ultimately to install the one world ruler. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, and I'll give you an old example and then a more recent example of what you're, uh, what you're talking about. Uh, if your listeners aren't familiar with him, a lot of them probably are, but uh, go read uh, General Marine, Marine, General Smedley Butler's uh, piece uh, that he wrote called War is a Racket. Uh, now, here's you know, a tough Marine general used to fighting valiantly and so forth, but uh, he, he would say things like, well, we've made the uh, Tampico safe for the oil boys and so he went through his whole series of wars uh, that we had uh, been engaged in uh, prior to when he wrote that and said, you know, one after another after another was basically for these powerful interests, the oil or whatever it was. And then uh, more recently, about uh, 30 or so years ago, L. Fletcher Prouty, who was uh, head of covert operations for the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, he wrote uh, a couple of books or so. One was about JFK and the assassination of Vietnam and so forth. But uh, uh, I quote him. I, I quote him in the, one of the books Dr. Stan mentioned, uh, the, the Secret Not Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan, where he uses these terms. I mean, he calls them the Power Elite and how they run things and how there's this group that has access to all the top secret information of our government. They're not in the government. They're, you know, they're not the CIA. They're, there's a separate secret group, and they have access to this information. And these are the guys who basically run things. I mean, he admitted it. So here you have a couple of examples. And now back to uh, Hold Rush that thought, Hold okay. that thought, Dennis. We're going to have to go to a break. And we'll be back in just a moment with Dr. Cuddy. Well, Dr. Stan, back here at the Genesis Communication Network, our guest, Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and we carry a, certainly a number of uh, Dr. Cuddy's books still in print, and certainly uh, the, the Road to Socialism is one of them. What are a couple of the others uh, that we carry, Dennis? 
Well, you carry the uh, 200-year education chronology. Right, right. Uh, there's the, the New World Order, rise of techno-feudalism, uh, the road to socialism, uh, and then the, the latest two, the secret Nazi plan, uh, Paralate, and the latest one, Paralate, their history of future. And then you carry that uh, three-volume set on uh, mental health, education, and social control. Right, so they're all available by giving us a call at 1-800-544-8927, one 800 books that I rely upon for accuracy, and that will really help you better to understand the truly diabolical forces working behind the scenes. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Well, uh, picking up on where I left off, um What's also important uh, is the the psychology, like Dr. Stan was saying about Edward Bernays and how they can manipulate people, and Bertrand Russell, you know, talking about the impact of science on society, and verses repeatedly intoned and said to me, they they have all of these uh, strategies they use, and uh, one one thing that you have to be very very careful about is uh, false hopes. Uh, you know, it's it's sort of like um, in Syria, where you, you fund these rebels and they go to overthrow the evil Assad and you know, put aside for the moment that a lot of those rebels are al-Qaeda members that, uh, you know, we, we're supposed to be at war with, but we're really not. There's the good al-Qaeda and the bad al-Qaeda, which I'm not going to go into now. But anyway... Uh, what they did is gin them up, you know, rev them up, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, just as we're about to attack, you know, and then you know, because of the chemical weapons and the, and the humanitarian crisis, all of a sudden, look what happens. Vladimir Putin comes in and says, hey, Bashar, want to turn over your chemical weapons to me? Okie dokie. And then all of a sudden, you don't hear about him anymore. You don't hear about an attack. Actually... What's going on, and I probably will write about this in my News with Views column, is it's part of a very, very specific strategy that they use. What you've done now is you've undercut the rebels because they now want Bashar al-Assad in, in power so that he can, over time, see, this, this is going to take some time. He's not going to be able to turn it all over in a month or two. Plus, it'd be very, very difficult in the middle of a civil war to do this, right? So now the incentive is for us to tamp down our aid to the rebels, right? In other words, we're going to stab, stab them in the back, back as we usually, you know, like with Taiwan. We will stay with you, Taiwan, till the end of time. Of course, the end of time came a lot quicker than the Taiwanese thought when we basically said, okay, China, communist China, they're yours. I mean, don't attack them, but uh, they're yours. You know, they're part of you. And so, you know, the, the nations of the world have become very, very familiar with our promises that we're going to do something, and then we basically turn our back on them or stab them in the back or leave them sort of dangling there slowly in the wind. And so what you have to watch out for is the, the the same sort of principle in the media. Uh, for example, uh, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity, to some extent, will get on there, and they'll they'll say the usual conservative line, right? Now, first of all, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity aren't idiots, all right? I mean, whatever you think of it, they're not idiots. And so they have to understand way down deep what they're doing. And what they're doing is uh, engendering a sort of false hope. Now, what happens when you got a lot of hope? You know, I have hope, 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 and then all of a sudden your hope comes dashing down. You get really depressed, right, really turned off. You say, forget the whole thing. I'm not going to try anymore. You know, just forget it. And that's a, that's a very, very important strategy that the paralyte uses to turn people off, you know, turn them off. So what does Russ Limbaugh do? For example, the, the standard line, is you work hard. You're an independent American, an individualist. We hate the communists. We don't like these liberals. We hate the welfare state. We're independent, hard-working Americans, and you just work really, really hard and strive and study, and you will achieve your your goals. You will achieve success. You know, and they say that's over and over and over again. You know, it's the American dream, and you do this. Well, what's wrong with that? 
Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. It's not that you shouldn't try and you shouldn't, you shouldn't study. So you should. You should try and study. But you have to temper that with reality. You have to temper it with reality. For example, I'll give you two, three examples quick like. Uh, there's 160,000 schools roughly in the country. 160, 170,000 schools in the country. Let's say in those schools, since uh, kids uh, like sports, let's say there's about, let's say, five kids in each school of, you know, 500,000 uh, who, say, who say, man, I want to be a great football star. I want to be a great basketball star. You know, I'm going to be great. And so they listen to Rush Limbaugh, and he says, hey, you can achieve your goal. Okay. So little Johnny, let's say he's seven years old, and man, he practices. He practices at basketball three hours a day. He even maybe neglects his studies, whatever. But I mean, he is good. By the time little Johnny gets out of high school, he is great. He is a fantastic, fantastic. And in college, I mean, he is wonderful. He is a fantastic basketball Basketball player, okay? What's wrong with that? Well, the the problem with that is one of sheer numbers, sheer numbers. Because if you consider success being I've made it to the pros, you know, the pros, I'm not sure exactly now how many pro basketball teams are. Let's say 20 or so. Let's say 20, right? And let's say they have maybe 20 or so players on each team, right? Okay, what's 20 times 20? 400, right? What's five times 160,000? That's 800,000. 800,000. 400 compared to 800,000. So once you have those 400 slots filled with the professional teams, in other words, you have achieved success because of all of your work since you were seven years old, what happens to the other 790,000 kids who've done just the same and who are fantastic? It's not a question that they're not good. They're very good, but there's not that many positions. Apply it to business, same thing. Little Johnny, seven years old. His parents are sitting there, Johnny, you must study. You must learn great managerial skills. You must study hard. You must get your knowledge of math must be superior. You must be, you know, fantastic and brilliant. And so little Johnny, you know, he's doing the same thing. And let's say there's 160,000. Let's say there's one child. One child in each of those schools, 160,000, who studies, studies his math, and he gets straight A's, and he gets A pluses, and he is, you know, he's dedicated and Boy, this, this kid's a genius, right? He goes through college, and he's a fantastic and magna cum laude and all that sort of stuff. And he has set as his goal to be president of General Motors, let's say, okay? What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that isn't that he shouldn't try and study and so forth, but what's wrong with it is there's only one president of General Motors. So what happens to the other, you know, 159,000 kids, right? So what you have to do is, yes, you study. Yes, you work hard. But this, this idea that all you have to do is work really hard and you will achieve your goal, that has to be tempered, tempered with reality. There's only so many CEO positions available. You know, I mean, once you've gone through, let's say, the Fortune 500, okay, there's 500 CEOs, but what happens to the rest of the kids who at seven years old dedicated their life to becoming a CEO? So uh, all I'm saying is you have to watch out for this, these false hopes, these false expectations. Yes, you should study. Yes, you should try. But always remember reality. Remember reality. Okay, now... In this book that we uh, were talking about last time, The Power Elite, Their History and Future, I'll just give a little quick background. We had gone through the historical outline, the economic and political part, and I was up to the part talking about values. And I had mentioned about uh, Brock Chisholm, head of the World Health Organization, saying how we had to get rid of these, this, uh, what he called these poisonous certainties, our parents and our Sunday and day school teachers and politicians and priests fed us. We have to get rid of this concept of right and wrong. So there in 1946, Brock Chisholm, head of this new organization, the World Health Organization, is undermining the concept of right and wrong. And we'll pick up after the break. And look and see what's happening in our society now that we've abandoned moral principles. Our form of government was made for a moral and religious people that wouldn't work for any other, and that's why it's not working. Well, I guess Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and Dennis, you pick up the story here, the last segment. 
Okay. Uh, well, I had uh, mentioned how uh, the head of the New World Health Organization wanted to get rid of the concepts of right and wrong. Uh, John Dewey, I mentioned uh, last week, uh, had uh, very, very great influence at Columbia University Teachers College, which was putting out uh, a tremendous number of our superintendents and principals in the, uh, in the nation. And he had signed the first Humanist Manifesto in 1933, indicating there's no God who's going to save us. You have to save ourselves. Uh, they got rid of uh, Bible reading and school prayer in the um, early 1960s. Uh, in Engel versus Vitali and Abington versus Shimp, those two cases. Uh, also, they at the end of the 60s and 1970, a leading educator ran for about 50 years or so, got a tremendous amount of uh, money, I think uh, $500 million from uh, Annenberg with the uh, Reader's Digest, was a Ted Sizer. He was at Brown University, and he co-authored a, a piece, uh, the introduction to a book called Five Lectures on Moral Education, 1970, where he said that Christian sermonizing denies individual autonomy. And uh, we can no longer uh, have a strict adherence to a code of conduct. That's that's out of date. Uh, we have to get rid of that. And so moving on, uh, you had in the 70s what you would call the, the feminist movement. And uh, I put an example in my book, The Paralete, um, Their uh, History and uh, Future, from a leading feminist of the day, November 14, 1981, The Nation, uh, liberal magazine, The Nation. Her name was uh, Ellen Willis, and she wrote that, quote, feminism is the cutting edge of a revolution in cultural and moral values. The objective of every feminist reform, from legal abortion to the ERA to child care programs, is to undermine traditional family values, end quote. That's her term. That's what she said the leader of the feminist movement, so they're undermining values. And so now you're in the 1980s, and uh, you, you have to understand that the values are formed when children are very, very small. And so uh, I remember I was in uh, Washington, and somebody gave me, uh, I think it was a songbook uh, that was being taught uh, in most of the schools in Maryland, Prince George's County and others, and in the songbook was the theme song from M.A.S.H., the TV show, popular TV show and movie. Well, if you you look at the title of it, it's actually the title is Suicide is Painless. I mean, everybody can hum the, the, the lines, you know, the melody, da 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 but that's the, the words. And they were teaching the song and the words, the lyrics, to the elementary school children. And the lyrics of that song proclaim that, quote, cheating is the only way to win, the game of life is lost anyway, and suicide is painless. That's that melody, suicide is painless. And, and then shortly thereafter, after, I remember the Washington Post came out with a little chart showing how uh, suicides were increasing among students. Uh, you know, duh. <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote a letter. They published it to the Washington Post. I wrote a letter. I said, what, what do you think is going to happen? You know, what do you think is going to happen? I'm sure it wasn't just Maryland, probably all over the country. They were teaching these little elementary kids, suicide is painless, and so forth and so on. And so uh, then you had further in the uh, the late 80s, I remember there was a, a, an attempt uh, upheld by Judge Brevard Hand at first to get secular humanism out of the schools and, you know, Alabama textbooks, uh, but they uh, got overturned in a two-to-one decision in Cincinnati, I think it was at the Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, same thing, uh, appeals court overturned Judge Thomas Holt's uh, ruling and said Tennessee students uh, could be required to read prayers to idols and be taught that Jesus was an illiterate. See, it's not simply that you can't have a prayer. Here in Tennessee, they were saying Jesus was an illiterate. Jesus was him. He was his God, right? Gee, God's an illiterate. Yeah. So anyway, it, <clears throat> it wasn't enough to just remove Bible reading and school prayer. They, they also said now the schools are going to attack, attack uh, Jesus. And so then we entered the 1990s, and uh, the Girl Scouts took a survey. And the survey, the Girl Scouts survey, 1990, found that 65%, 65% of high school students would cheat on an important exam. 
on an important exam. And uh, I have a tape. I got a, a tape, a recording, uh, January 22, that same year, 1990. And it was on NBC's Today Show. And it was a Dr. Michael Lewis of the New Jersey Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And he said, quote, this is on the tape, quote, lying is an important part of social life. And children who are unable to do it are children who may have developmental problems, end quote. See? So you need to lie. On the Today Show, a uh, leading medical person, children need to be able to lie. And so <clears throat> you have this constant undermining. The next year, 1991, I go through these in my book here, The Parallel, The History and Future. Uh, James Patterson and Peter Kim uh, wrote, The Day America Told the Truth, What People Really Believe About Everything That Really Matters. That was published. And what it did was detail poll results showing that Americans are, quote, making up their own moral codes, end quote. Remember? See, that's what Ted Sizer said back in 1970. Uh, the polls further show that 9 of 10 citizens, 9 of 10 reported that they lie regularly, regularly. One-third of all married Americans indicated they've had an affair. One-third. And 7% say that for uh, $10 million, they would kill a stranger. I mean, think of that. Almost 10% of the American public said, you give me $10 million, I'll go out and kill that guy, that stranger. I, I don't know him, I'll just kill him. I'll just kill him. That shows you to what extent we've degenerated. Uh, Patterson's and Kim's uh, survey also found that one in five women say that they had uh, been date raped. Now, is that a big surprise? Not when you've been looking at soap operas. If you look at the soap operas of that period, what happens is you would find that characters like Luke on General Hospital, Ross on All My Children, and John on As the World Turns, those three characters on those three soap operas all raped women and became heroes later on those soap operas. Well, we're going to have to let you go. We're dead as we're out of time, but I think what you're pointing out is what our recurrent theme, and that is America is now a post-Christian nation, yep. and really we have lost our moral foundation. And believe me, ladies and gentlemen, when a nation turns against God, God turns against that nation. God bless. We'll talk to you next week at uh, the next hour. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, this is uh, Dr. Stan, and we do carry Dr. Cuddy's books. You need to get them. You need to read them. And you can get them by calling 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Then you, certainly this uh, coming Sunday evening on the at 9 o'clock p.m. on the West Coast, probably across the country, on the National Geographic Channel, they're having a two-hour documentary on what happens when they turn the lights out uh, in America. And we have 10 days of darkness and no food. Uh, this, of course, is time to correspond with uh, the exercise they're having on the 13th and 14th of uh, November, uh, which, of course, will simulate an EMP or solar event, which will turn off the electricity. And the question is, why are they coordinating this right now as we're facing the very real possibility of suddenly... Iran on the verge of developing a nuclear weapon. Israel having said that they are going to unilaterally attack Iran if uh, they, it looks like they're going to develop a nuclear weapon. And Iran saying that if they are attacked by Israel, they will counter by attacking the great Satan, America, and will destroy it. How could Iran destroy America? Very simply, with an EMP attack, all they need is one bomb and I'm convinced they've had it. I've known this for many years, and you can find it as well. Go up to the Internet and type in Washington Times, October 2011, Iran has nuclear bomb. Of course, everything's being done to suppress this because your mind is controlled by the people who control the media. But begin looking into it. We have a great four-CD set and a great DVD at the threat of an EMP attack. You need to get it. You need to begin making your preparations because when this occurs... Within a week, while the whole financial system of America has collapsed, and everything you've worked for your whole life is gone, your pension will be gone, your annuities will be gone, your bonds will be gone, your, your shares that you have, everything tied to the dollar will certainly not exist and may never come back during your lifetime. I'm not just babbling. Well, we certainly get the 2008 Congressional Commission report on the threat of an EMP attack. If you can't find it on the Internet, we'll be glad to sell you one. But 
that if you want to get one off the internet, that's fine. So uh, we provide them because we need to make the money to keep going. And if you want to help us, you can. We do hope many of you out there will give serious consideration to joining the Radio Liberty family because right now, of course, people are not buying the number of books and DVD sets and, and certainly CD sets that they have in the past because people are really beginning to hurt. The whole financial system is beginning to contract. So if you're in a position to join the Radio Liberty family and help us, we'd sure love to hear from you. I certainly, I do not take a salary. My wife doesn't take a salary. We do what we're doing because we're trying to sound the alarm and let people understand that behind everything going on are powerful and sinister evil forces. If you haven't read my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, shame on you. You need to get it. Our number 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Remember Dr. Cuddy's books, my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, and then pray for America. Pray for revival. Pray for our leaders, but pray for our liberty, our provision, and our protection.